Rome, the capital city of Italy, is one of the most exhilarating, romantic, and popular travel destinations in Europe, attracting six and a half million tourists each year. Here you can soak up the atmosphere of gladiatorial battles. Go for the ride of your life around the city's hottest sites. And relive La Dolce Vita at some of the coolest bars in the city. Described as the Eternal City, Rome is famous for the ancient ruins of its former empire and its reputation for glamour and romance. With so much to see and do, the Travel Channel has toured the city and put together our own guide to Rome's top ten highlights. And for those who like their food, we seek out the very best in pizza, pasta and ice cream. First up, the fountain that was made famous in the movie La Dolce Vita. The Trevi Fountain is at number 10. The Trevi Fountain is certainly the largest in Rome, but it's not alone. Romans have always had a special relationship with water, which spouts from fountains everywhere in the city. In fact, Rome is a fountain lover's dream. It's hard to walk anywhere without hearing the sound of splashing water. But it was here that Anita Ekberg immersed herself in the turbulent waters of the Trevi Fountain in the 1960 film La Dolce Vita. This fountain is undoubtedly the best known in Rome, and it's a huge attraction for tourists. But at night, it completely takes your breath away. It was designed by Niccolo Salvi in 1762 and shows Neptune as the central figure, flanked by two sea gods. While one struggles to master his unruly seahorse, the other leads a much calmer steed. This symbolizes the two contrasting moods of the sea, which seems to burst out of an artificial cliff face built into the wall of the Palazzo Poli. The water that pours over the fountain was brought to Rome by an underground aqueduct called the Aqua Vergine and there's a carving above the fountain showing Roman soldiers discovering the actual spring from where the water flowed. The Trevi Fountain is known as the queen of all monuments and some have argued that it's the most beautiful fountain in the world, others the most beautiful piece of architecture. Many visitors may assume that the Trevi Fountain has always been there, but by Roman standards the Fontana di Trevi is actually very new. In 1732, the story of the Trevi Fountain really begins, because that's when Pope Clements XII commissioned a man by the name of Nicholas Salvi to design the fountain. He was an architect, he was an artist, and most of all, he was a sculptor and a genius. But Salvi's work was not admired by everyone. On the other side of this wall was a barber shop, and in it, a barber who was not too pleased about the construction going on around his business. He would come out every day and scream at Nicholas Salvi, sometimes from a distance, sometimes directly in his face as the story goes, Nicholas Salvi, your fountain is so ugly. The noise, the craziness, all of this ruins my business. You are terrible, I hate you and I hate your fountain. Well, Nicholas Salvi got a little tired of this and in turn, he built this, a gigantic wave crashing up against the side of the wall, which happens to be directly in front of this man's business. So, people inside, could hear the water flowing, they could hear the fountain, and they could hear people enjoying the fountain, but they could not see it. And there's an urban legend that says no business had lasted more than six months behind that wave. The Trevi Fountain was also immortalized by the 1954 film Three Coins in the Fountain, and it's thought that this is how the tradition of throwing coins into the fountain began. The uh, idea is you take a coin in your right hand and throw it over your left shoulder. One coin, you shall return to Rome. Two coins, you shall return to Rome and be kissed. Three coins, you shall return to Rome, be kissed, fall in love, and get married. But not all travelers realize that you have to throw the coin in this way if your wish to come true. Who knows, if you throw the coin correctly, you may get lucky. But even if your wish doesn't come true, none of the money will be wasted. The Trevi Fountain is regularly drained and cleaned. The coins are then swept up and collected in bucketfuls. All the Italian lira goes to the maintenance of the fountain itself, and all the foreign currency is donated to charity. So no matter what, you're giving your money to a good cause. 
As you can see, there's people throwing coins in all over the place right now. In fact, that goes on all day and all night, every day of the year. And the bottom line is, if you're bored in Rome, you come here and this place is rocking and rolling all the time. There's always something entertaining, and if you don't want to watch the fountain, there's plenty of people to watch as well. The Trevi Fountain is a must-see at number 10 because it's a masterpiece which can be visited any time of the day or night. It's a great place for a photo opportunity and to capture one of the most incredible sights in Rome. This is Saturday night. Saturday night's the night and in at number 9, for this is Rome, the Eternal City. As darkness falls over the enchanting skyline, it signals the start of a buzzing atmosphere in the open air of Rome's piazzas. Every night is lively in Rome, especially in the warm summer months, but Saturday night is party night. Saturday night in Rome is different because you have every style in the world, every history since it began, and we get to do it all with a few beers. It's 10 o'clock in Piazza Navona. Some street performers are still out entertaining the crowds, but it's early for Saturday night, a time when people just hang out and do their own thing. But in Campo dei Fiori, things are beginning to warm up. Young people are out, meeting up with friends. Some, perhaps, in the hope of meeting new ones. One of the most popular Saturday night hotspots is Vineria. Despite its unassuming entrance, it has a devoted following of regulars and is one of the places to be seen. It offers an extensive range of wines, champagnes, and beers. And this is a bar with a true sense of Roman style. I like Vineria because I can, I can uh, come here and, and speak in Italian with the Romans and, and try to enjoy life as Romans enjoy it. Uh, there's, there's numerous American bars around, uh, around Rome, but I can go to American bars in America. But if you're looking for something a little more outrageous for Saturday night, then make your way to Jonathan's Bar on Via della Fossa, just behind Piazza Navona. It's literally bursting at the seams with people who've come to be entertained in its wild surroundings and to be served by one of Jonathan's angels. This is Saturday night in Rome at Jonathan's Bar. This bar is an award winner for its interior design. Every inch is decorated in the crazy style of the owner whose portraits cover the walls. But the pièce de résistance has to be the bathroom. It's this that attracts an amazing pilgrimage of visitors. It really must be seen to be believed, but it seems some Americans have already discovered this place for themselves. We have a lot of American tourists coming here because they have people they know back in America. They've just been here and they've told about Jonathan's Angels and that it's a place that you should check out. On Saturday night, almost anything goes around the bars in Rome. Well, the bars in Rome are great because you can have any drink from anywhere in the world. The women are beautiful, the men are friendly, can't beat it. And their mopeds drive right through the bar, and you can't get that anywhere in America. I assure you of that. So, Saturday night makes it in at number nine. Bars don't close until the early hours of the morning, so you can start early and stay late. Though most don't really hot up until after ten. You're watching the Travel Channel. Ciao. Coming up, we reveal the hotel where top American celebrities relax and take in the Roman sunset. At number eight, indulge in the luxury of fine dining and romance at the Hotel Eden. The Hotel Eden, just behind Piazza di Spagna, opened its doors to the first guests in 1889. Its golden book records hundreds of memorable signatures, and it's a firm favorite of show business celebrities, from Omar Sharif and Tina Turner to a younger generation of stars like Matt Damon and Cameron Diaz. The Eden prides itself on its Roman hospitality, and as a boutique hotel offers just 120 rooms. The secret of its success is making each visitor feel like a personal guest. I consider the Eden a club as 70% of our clients are return guests. People say it's the best. I'm not the one who have to say the best hotel in Rome, but um, I can assure you that it's one of the best hotel in Europe. Standing on a hill on the corner of Via Ludovisi and Via Porta Pinciana, 
the Eden is renowned for its breathtaking views of the Eternal City from every room. Here in the penthouse suite, you can wake up in the luxurious surroundings of your bedroom and enjoy sights like these every morning. Even the Roman spa-style bathroom has its own unique view to be savored whilst enjoying a jacuzzi. But while you can watch the outside world, your privacy is guaranteed. These windows are mirrored from the outside. At the Eden, no expense is spared to make your stay memorable. $13,000 is spent each month just on flowers. And in the second bathroom of the penthouse, $11,500 was spent on this mosaic. And for the ultimate dining experience, visit the Eden's Terrace Restaurant on the top floor. Here, you can literally eat like a prince or a princess. Each dish is specially prepared by executive chef Enrico de Flinger. Enrico's cuisine has not only been awarded a Michelin star, he was also the personal chef of Princess Diana and Prince Charles for three years at Kensington Palace. The Travel Channel was given exclusive access to his kitchen to discover the secret of his success. In each plate there is two, three different ingredients, you know, and I want, when you close the eyes, so you test them, you know, if not, I don't like to put four, 10, 12, 15 ingredients in one dish, you know, and then you don't test any of them, you know. Every morning, Enrico checks over his ingredients to make sure they are fresh and also the very best. So we choose the first one, you know, the big one, the really big one, and the rest goes to the market, you know. These giant shrimp are then split in half and grilled with breadcrumbs, herbs, and olive oil. And this is the finished dish. We serve, we present them like this. Enrico is in charge of 20 chefs in his kitchen and 20 restaurant staff. On a busy day, they can prepare up to 500 dishes. But the ultimate inspiration has to be working in this unique environment with its fantastic view. The success of the terrace is Enrico, certainly, but is also the view. You eat, you have the Vatican, Spanish square, you have the Colosseum, and this is part also of your dinner. And if it's romance you're after, you won't be disappointed. As the sun sets over the eternal city, it's easy to see why the Hotel Eden is called a corner of paradise. But you don't have to be a resident guest to experience this beautiful view. Whatever the occasion, the bar staff will happily prepare you an exotic cocktail to sip while you enjoy the most amazing and romantic Roman sunset. Any girl, if she will come with a boyfriend here and he will ask her, do you like to get married? She will say yes, if she have a drink at the sunset here. It's something marvelous. I understand them very well why they choose the Eden Terrace to demonstrate the love they have because it's something really fantastic, really fantastic. But the Eden's luxury and romance does come at a price. The penthouse suite, favored by Liv Tyler, Johnny Depp and Cameron Diaz, costs just over $4,000 for a night. It may be more than some can afford to stay, but you can always come for a romantic drink and that's why it's in our countdown at number eight. Next, the most historic place in Rome makes it in at number seven. The Roman Forum is a must-see for most visitors to Rome. It's where the Romans inspired the creation of the first world state. But to really appreciate these ruins, it's best to have a small grasp of its history or make sure you go with a knowledgeable guide, like Darius Aria, a Roman archaeologist. The Roman Forum, once at the center of the entire Mediterranean world, was the hub of all political, commercial, and judicial life in ancient Rome. This is where everything happened. Here in the front, what we had was a very massive structure with many, many uh, shops and spaces for you to store your things. It's essentially a very large warehouse, which was here. You could store any implement, anything that you were going to use or trade. Initially in the Forum, you had all the markets, beef, fish, buying and selling and trading, getting loans for money, suing people. They were such a litigious society. I think other than the Americans, nobody's ever sued so much in the history of mankind. These guys love to sue over anything, property rights, hereditary rights, everything. 
Set in a valley between the Capitoline Hill and the Palatine Hill, the best way to get your first view of the Forum is from a high point. With a little imagination, you should be able to rebuild a sense of the history and hustle of Roman life. Down in front of us, uh, through these trees, you see some people walking. That is actually the Via Sacra, the most important road, the sacred way, Via Sacra, which then leads into the Forum, through the Forum, and then eventually it's going to lead up into uh, the Capitoline Hill. So this is the main artery, the main principal street. This was also the route taken by triumphal processions, which made their way through the Forum toward the Capitol to offer sacrifice. As a visitor, it's incredible to imagine that you're actually treading in the footsteps of victorious Roman emperors. It's also hard to believe that such a prosperous place could fall into such decay, but after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Forum was left in ruins and its relics were pillaged during medieval and Renaissance times. So, as you walk through, it's good to see the Forum now being excavated and restored by the University of Rome and a National Archaeological Trust in Italy. Once you've seen the aerial view, walk down to the ground level where Romans once conducted their everyday business. You'll see the remains of temples built to honor the emperors, who were often declared gods after their death by the Senate. And along the Via Sacra, to the right of the arch of Septimus Severus, this modern-looking building was the all-powerful Senate House built by Julius Caesar. Around 300 senators sat here to make vital decisions about the empire, including war. This would have been the equivalent of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And it holds a curious secret. To the right and left of the doors, we see a series of recessed panels with a concrete facing. And those are the remains of tombs. After the Senate House had become a church in about 630 A.D., people were being buried inside and they wanted to be buried as close as they could to the saint who was buried inside of them. But as room ran out inside the church, people were buried within its walls. There's the things you read about, but you never see. It's only maybe once in your lifetime. And this is it. It's really old, too. United States, um, things are about 200 years old. You think it's old? Here, 1,000 years old is not that old. Another intriguing ruin is the Temple of Vesta. Vesta was the Roman goddess of hearth and home, and she was represented by a sacred flame which had to be kept alight by the young Vestal virgins. They were girls who were dedicated to the goddess at six years old, six to ten years old, and they had to serve the goddess faithfully for 30 years. And uh, if they ever committed adultery because they had to be chaste, they were essentially buried alive as punishment. In 410 AD, the Goths conquered Rome, destroying much of the Forum but they left a poignant reminder of the moment the glory of the Roman Empire was overthrown. It remained a secret until it was unearthed by modern archaeology. When the barbarians were coming into the city and attacking it at the early 5th century AD, they set a lot of buildings on fire, including in the Forum. So what we have to imagine then is some Roman here minding his own business, suddenly they're attacked, the building is in flames, he runs out, drops his bag of money, doesn't stop to pick it up, and this bit of money melts, it's fused, these bronze coins melt right into the pavement. The Travel Channel was given access to these coins, which are kept away from the public to maintain their preservation. The Roman Forum, however, is free to visitors. The best way to get there is by metro to Colosseo Station. If you walk up from the Colosseum, you'll pass the magnificent Arch of Titus, the oldest triumphal arch in Rome, which overlooks the Forum itself. The Forum is an amazing journey through the history of the Roman Empire and deserves its place at number seven. Coming up, the thrills and spills of seeing the sights on two wheels. Must be the most from traumatized horses in the world. Next, experience the pleasures of Piazza Life at number six. There are around a hundred piazzas in the city of Rome. Some are bustling social centers, while others are small havens of tranquility. There are far more than we could include in Rome's must-see countdown, but we've chosen three that are well worth a visit. Starting with Piazza Navona, this is perhaps one of Europe's most beautiful and extravagant squares. It's lined with cafes and restaurants and is completely pedestrianized. It's a magnet for tourists, street performers, and artists alike. A place that's seemingly timeless, 
Here you can sit for hours, sipping a coffee or a peritivo. Piazza Navona is my favorite place. I tell everyone to come here because of just what we're seeing now. People strolling through where the young people are flirting and the old people are engaging each other. It's, it's, it's my favorite place in all Rome, is Piazza Navona. And it's here, in front of Sant'Agnese in Agone Church, that you can see Bernini's fantastic Fontana dei Quattro Fiumi, or Fountain of the Four Rivers. Built in the 17th century, the four stone figures represent the four great rivers of the then known world. The Ganges, the Danube, the Plate, and the Nile. But there's a story behind it, as told by American writer Jeffrey Kennedy, that makes you really appreciate this masterpiece. Now the story goes, but it's completely apocryphal, that Bernini made these two river gods here in reaction to the church. One is hiding his head, because he doesn't want to see it. This is the story. The other is looking at it with horror, like it's going to fall on him. But these are not true. Why? Because this fountain was finished in 1651. The church wasn't finished until 1653. So in fact, it's impossible that this kind of interchange between the two could be true. The fact, that, the fact is that the Nile is hiding his head because at that time, nobody had yet discovered the source of the Nile. But nobody's been able to explain why Plate is holding his hand up in this way. The church was built by another 17th century master called Borromini. It's said that he and Bernini were fierce rivals, which makes the story all the more intriguing. The foundations of the buildings surrounding the huge oblong of Piazza Navona were at one time the ruined grandstands of the vast stadium of Domitian, built in the first century AD. Here up to 30,000 people could sit and enjoy athletic events and chariot races. Another popular square on the list of places to go is Campo dei Fiori. This is one of the busiest 24-hour piazzas in central Rome. So this is Campo dei Fiori. And as you can see, in the daytime, it's plenty lively in, uh, in a popular, traditional kind of way. At night, it actually becomes one of Rome's liveliest night spots for young people. But Campo dei Fiori is best known for its traditional and bright food market. You'll find things here that you're unlikely to find anywhere else. <laughs> Buongiorno. This is one of, uh, one of Campo dei Fiori's most unique stalls, I would say. Um, here you see a whole array of different herbal mixtures, spices, for making all of the famous Roman dishes. Um, there's a little bit of carbonara, pasta al pesto, um, pasta mix. This is, this is their own, Mauro's very own, grazie. <laughs> there's even an aromatic spice mix named after the piazza itself, Campo dei Fiori. Peperoncino, a little onion, and basilico. It's a little bit picante, it's a little bit spicy. But to get the best produce, make sure you get here in the morning as the market starts to pack up shortly after lunch. Campo dei Fiori wasn't always as colorful. It has a much darker past. This was once the site of gruesome executions. Right in the center of the square is the imposing statue of Giordano Bruno, a philosopher who was burnt at the stake for heresy on this very spot in 1600. Just a short walk away is Piazza della Rotonda, named after this very famous building, the Pantheon, which was built in the second century AD and is now the most complete ancient Roman structure in the city. The Pantheon is one of the absolute must-sees when you come to Rome. And so its piazza, as you can see, is lined with cafes and always full of people, day and night. Again, like Piazza Navona, like the other major piazzas, this is one of the places that people come just to sit and contemplate this amazing object. So, the best piazzas in Rome are at number six. We're halfway through the countdown of Rome's must-see attractions. At number ten is the magnificent Trevi Fountain. Number nine is Saturday Night. Number eight is a corner of paradise, the Hotel Eden. Number seven, the historic Roman Forum. And at number six, sit and relax in Piazza Life. And next, our top five highlights in Rome. Hey, you're watching the Travel Channel. Hold on tight. Check left and right. They're everywhere in Rome and in at number five, the motor scooter. The 
The motor scooter or motorino is the epitome of Rome chic and something no self-respecting young Roman can be seen without. Italy's most iconic motor scooter has always been the Vespa, on the back of which Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck fell in love in the 1952 movie Roman Holiday. But today, although Rome's love affair with the Vespa continues, many other models have now been accepted into the Roman way of life. Throughout the busy streets, while the rest of the traffic is often at a standstill, the small motorino is guaranteed to be seen squeezing its way to the front of the line. This is the way novelist Eli Gottlieb travels around the city. For him, it's the only way to get to work on time. Uh, motorini are one of the heartbeats of Rome. They're the best way ever invented to get around the city, and uh, I personally would be lost without one. Every morning I get up at uh, about 7 o'clock, come downstairs, fire up the bike, and uh, within about 15 minutes of having woken up, I'm sitting at my desk. Rome as a city was made for Motorino. It's not a, it's not a rationally planned city like, like New York or to a lesser extent Paris. It's total chaos. There's no grid. It's make it up as you go along. This is the kind of situation in which the Motorino excels when you have traffic of a certain density that's moving but that's pretty thick. And then the Motorino kind of comes into its own as a a point and squirt machine. As a tourist, because of parking and road restrictions, you'll find it almost impossible to drive around the city, unless you take a taxi or a bus. But even these will give you a limited sense of Rome. For a, a traveler coming to Rome and wanting a taste of the real Rome, a scooter is ideal because it allows you to see the city in 360 degrees, it allows you to smell and hear the city, and it allows you furthermore to get a sense a little bit of what it's like from the Roman point of view because the, the motor scooter is the Roman experience. It is one of the essential daily experiences of the city and to really see that from the Roman's point of view and not from the smoke glass of your tour bus uh, is fantastic. So it really doesn't matter who you are or how old you are. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. On an average day in a motorino, you can see a true cross-section of Roman humanity, from 15-year-olds with elaborately gelled hair and spandex pants to professors of 80 years old on their way to the university. You can see 20-something uh, businesswomen with impeccably coiffed hair, long nails and heels, smoking a cigarette and chattering away on their cell phones. You can see uh, pregnant women. I've seen nuns. It's easy to hire a motor scooter in Rome. There are numerous rental companies which can be checked out in any guidebook or yellow pages. But there are some hazards you should be aware of. The nemesis uh, of the motorino driver is the suddenly opened car door, which no amount of alertness can really protect you against. Uh, you have to stay in a state of sort of hyper uh, alertness when you drive. You have to monitor everything around you to watch out for these horse-drawn carriages. This must be the most from traumatized horses in the world. But for those hoping to recapture the romance and freedom of the movie Roman Holiday, the Vespa is a must. Its compact size and easy handling makes it an ideal scooter for the city traveler. This motor scooter has a strong following of fans around the world. In fact, many Americans will already feel at home on a Vespa. The Vespa Club of Rome regularly meets here at Bar Canada on Via Pasquale Baffi. This place has become a mecca for Vespa enthusiasts to swap news, give health and advice, and to share their passion for the ultimate Italian moped. There's no doubt the Vespa is part of Rome's social history, but the motor scooter in general has become a national symbol, almost as recognizable as the Colosseum itself, and that's why it makes it into Rome's countdown at number five. Up next, it's Poser's Paradise, the place to see and be seen. At number four, it's the place to be seen, the Spanish Steps. Despite their name, the Spanish Steps, which sweep down into Piazza di Spagna, were actually commissioned by the French and built in the 1720s. But a century earlier, the square below was home to Spain's ambassador to the Holy See, hence the names of both these steps and the piazza itself. 
In its early years, the Spanish Steps were a hangout for young hopefuls waiting to be chosen as artists' models. And today, the scene is a very similar one. It's a platform for international posing, a place to see and be seen. Vista Tourist is the epitome of the romantic, fashionable, and excessive aspects of all of Rome. This is a meeting place for young Italians seeking significant others and love in the city of Amor. Roma, spelled backwards, is of course Amor. To many Americans, the Spanish Steps are the epitome of romantic Rome. It was where Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck appeared in the movie Roman Holiday. And today, it's a favorite spot for newlyweds to take a similar stroll in all their finery and then to pose in the piazza for that all-important wedding video. At the top of the steps is the impressive French church Trinita dei Monti with its double bell towers. It was built largely in the 16th century and paid for by the French king. In front of the church is one of Rome's distinctive Egyptian-style obelisks, which date back to the city's ancient history. And from the terrace in front of the church, it's quite a scene below. From up here, you can get a great view of the Spanish Steps, La Fontana de Barcaccio, and directly opposite the Spanish Steps is a street known as Via Condotti. At the bottom of the steps is the Fontana de la Barcaccia, better known as the leaking boat, because of the way the water pours out of holes in the stern and the bow. It's this fresh spring water that attracts large numbers of visitors. Not only do they drink directly from the fountain, they take the opportunity to fill up water bottles for later on. It's also a great place to cool off. This is also a good time to point out the fact that not only this water at this fountain, but all the water in Rome supplied by faucets, fountains, is the best drinking water, city water, in all of Europe. This reputation for the quality of Rome's water is because it comes directly from the surrounding hills via aqueducts. But don't be fooled into quenching your thirst from any fountain. Watch out for those signs that warn you not to drink. But it's not just the quality of the water that draws crowds to the Spanish steps. Piazza di Spagna is also at the heart of Rome's fashion world. Directly opposite the Spanish steps is a street known as Via Condodi, which is a center of Italian fashion where you can find designer stores like Prada, Gucci, Armani, Cartier, and if you're not interested in clothes, the oldest cafe in all of Rome, Cafe Greco. There's also a legend that says that any cardinal that comes in and sits down is destined to one day become Pope. Opened by a Greek merchant in 1760, Café Greco became a favorite meeting place for foreign artists and writers. More recently, Orson Welles drank here. Even Buffalo Bill apparently passed through its doors and, so legend says, enjoyed a meal with a Café Americano. Today, while Romans stand in the foyer to sip their espresso coffees, tourists tend to favor the cozy surroundings of the back rooms, surrounded by paintings of the great city. But if English tea is more to your taste, check out Babington's Tea Rooms, which is just to the left of the Spanish Steps. Opened in 1896 by two Englishwomen, here you can savor scones and jam with pots of Earl Grey tea and plenty of homemade cakes. But for those with larger appetites, the menu also offers a range of hamburgers as well as muffins and cinnamon toast. So with all these things to do and see around Piazza di Spagna, it's easy to see why the Spanish steps are a focal point for people to meet, relax, and soak up the atmosphere. And that's why we've made them number four. Eating gelato is one of my top ten things to do in Rome. Pizza, pasta, and gelato share the number three spot in Rome's top ten countdown. Eating is, of course, one of the main pleasures of a trip to Rome, and you'll be spoiled for choice with restaurants. But the most popular foods for busy travelers are those which Italy is famous for, and the Travel Channel has tried and tested three of the best. The quality of a good Roman pizza is its thin, crisp baked crust, which is cooked to perfection in a wood-fired oven. You can tell its authenticity by the hint of charcoal around the edges. Here at Pizzeria Ai Marmi in Viale di Trastevere, that's exactly how their pizzas are made. First, the dough is beaten and rolled out until it's wafer thin. Then a generous helping of tomato sauce is spooned over before a variety of toppings are heaped on top. One of the most popular pizzas here is the Napolitana, with a simple topping of tomato, mozzarella, anchovies, and a dash of olive oil. 
But here, you can always make a special request. If they have the ingredients, they'll serve it for you. And for special customers, they'll even reserve a place for the family pet. The temperature inside the large open oven has to be an incredible 750 degrees Fahrenheit for the pizzas to be cooked to perfection. And timing is everything. Just two to three minutes is all it takes for the base to be crisp and the topping to reach just the right consistency. And not just any wood will do. This is oak. It retains the heat and lasts longer than any other type. At Aymarmi, pizzas cost between four and six dollars. But such is its popularity that you'll probably have to wait for a sidewalk table during the summer months. And don't expect to linger once you sit down inside at one of the marble top tables, which give this restaurant its well-known nickname, the Morgue. But if your preference is for pasta, look no further than Ditti Rambo, just off Campo di Fiori. Here you can be sure all the pasta is freshly made each morning. Antonia and Luisa have been working at DT Rambo since it opened five years ago. And it's their pasta that keeps customers coming back to the restaurant for more. They know the secret of making and rolling the pasta to just the right consistency. <laughs> and you won't be disappointed by the size of the portions. This particular filling for ravioli is made with fresh mushrooms, flour, eggs, and Parmesan cheese. It's then mixed to a thick textured paste, ready for filling the pasta. The ravioli is cooked gently for a few minutes to be served with a simple sauce or perhaps something a little more adventurous. And for those with a sweet tooth, Rome's famous ice cream or gelato is a must. Here, it's enjoyed absolutely without guilt any time of the day or night. You'll find a gelateria displaying a colorful array of flavors at almost every tourist attraction. But if you want to enjoy gelato that's freshly made on the premises, then Palazzo del Fredo is your destination. Palazzo del Fredo is an unmissable four-story building on Via Principe Eugenio. It has a bright, airy parlor in the front and out the back is the room where they make their own ice cream. The Sicilian Fassi family have been making ice cream here since the 1920s, and Palazzo del Fredo holds a little-known secret. It served its ice cream to American soldiers who stayed here when the Allied troops liberated Italy during the Second World War. Today, it's one of the most famous ice cream shops in Rome and attracts people from all over the world. Here you can take time choosing your flavors and have as many scoops as can fit in a cone. And this is a small one. <laughs> I have to say this is the best ice cream I've ever tasted. <laughs> but the gelato has a particular fascination for children, like young Marcel. Children love the ice cream and they come here and they see so much flavors and so much colors and they are uh, uh, bewitched. But it didn't take too long for Marcel to make his final decision. Out of these three, it was hard to choose a favorite, and that's why we've allowed pizza, pasta, and gelato to share the glory at number three. Coming up, it's home to the world's most important Catholic church and attracts millions of pilgrims each year. At number two in Rome's must-see attractions is the Vatican, home to St. Peter's, the world's most important Catholic church. Wherever you travel in Rome, you'll be reminded of its religious importance at almost every turn. It's home to around 900 churches. Its streets teem with nuns, priests, and monks who come from all over the world to study at one of the Catholic universities. Rome is at the heart of the Catholic faith and more than three million pilgrims come here to the Vatican City in St. Peter's each year. This is the seat of power for the Roman Catholic Church. The Vatican City is situated on the west bank of the Tiber. It's the world's smallest independent state, a nation about the size of New York's Central Park. Yet despite its population of around 900, this is a country that has immense power and international influence. It holds billions of dollars in property and treasures, 
and is home to the Sistine Chapel and one of the world's greatest art collections. It even has its own radio station, post office, and unique security service which dates back to 1506. These are the Swiss Guards, originally enlisted for mercenaries of the Swiss Confederacy because of their reputation as excellent soldiers. They wear the distinctive blue, yellow, and red uniform said to have been designed by Michelangelo. They guard the Vatican, which is surrounded by high walls on the western side and only opens to the rest of the city in the form of St. Peter's Square. St. Peter's Square was created by the great architect Bernini in the 17th century and has been acclaimed as an architectural masterpiece. There are 284 gigantic columns in the semicircular colonnades within which Christians of the world gather in front of the world's most imposing church, St. Peter's. Its massive dome, designed by Michelangelo, is one of the most famous sites in the world as a symbol of Catholicism. And in Rome, it can be seen gracing the skyline from virtually everywhere in the city. Underneath it, the main body of the church, the Basilica, is the largest in Christianity. This amazing structure was built over the tomb of St. Peter, the Apostle, who came to Rome around 50 AD and was martyred during Nero's persecutions. It was Peter whom Jesus called the Rock. We look to the Gospel, chapter 16, the Gospel according to Matthew, and you will read a phrase which really cites primacy in St. Peter, saying that he is the first vicar of Christ, the first substitute for Christ on earth. And this begins, you are a rock, upon this rock I will build my church, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In Christian iconography, when you see St. Peter, he's always shown with the keys. St. Peter was heaven's representative on earth, and by apostolic tradition, the Pope is his direct spiritual descendant. When he's in Rome, Pope John Paul II gives a public audience every Wednesday morning, and on Sundays he gives his blessing from the study window of his residence to the crowds in St. Peter's Square below. But one of the best views of St. Peter's can actually be reserved by guests staying at the residence Paolo VI. It's been described as the residence of the gates of heaven because of its unique position in the extraterritorial zone right beside the Vatican City. Here guests can take in this rare view from the terrace, or if you're lucky enough to be staying in one of their suites facing St. Peter's, you may even see the Pope's blessing from your bedroom window on Sunday mornings. It's free to go inside St. Peter's Basilica, although there's a small charge to go up to the Great Dome but there is a strict dress code which means legs and shoulders must be covered. It's easy to get to by metro or bus and is a must-see for all travelers to the city. Because of its importance in Rome, the Vatican and St. Peter's is in our top 10 at number two. So far in our top 10 highlights of Rome, at number 10, relive La Dolce Vita at the Trevi Fountain. At number nine, it's Saturday night. At number eight, it's luxury and romance at the Hotel Eden. At seven, the hub of the Roman Empire, the Roman Forum. At six, enjoy Piazza Life. At five, the buzz of Roman roads, the motor scooter. At four, the place to be seen, the Spanish steps. At three, food to feast your eyes. At number two, the Vatican City. And next, it's the number one place to visit in Rome. At number one in Rome's must-see countdown, it's the Colosseum, a truly incredible experience. My favorite thing in Rome is right behind me. It's called the Colosseum. Actually, the original name of it is called the Flavian Amphitheater. It was built in 72 AD, and it was finished in 80 AD. It took him eight years to build. Uh, a lot of fighting, a lot of blood, a lot of guts, basically. That's what I like. Built in the first century as a gift to the Roman people, this awe-inspiring monument has become Rome's most recognizable symbol and attracts over two million visitors each year. Emperor Vespasian commissioned the Colosseum to fill a massive lake that his predecessor Nero had excavated for his own private use. And when it was finished, this huge circus could hold up to 70,000 spectators, for it was the right of everyone in society to enjoy free entertainment. On the outside, the Colosseum is constructed in a series of arches on three levels, topped by a fourth story or attic. On the ground level were 80 entrances for the thousands of spectators but entry was by a strict ticketing system. 76 of the arches had numbers chiseled above them, which matched the numbers stamped on the back of every clay ticket. The other four arches were reserved for the emperor and the imperial class, and of course, the gladiators. 
Inside, the seating was arranged in tiers and divided according to class. Now, when you enter the Colosseum, you'll end up in this open area. This is where the emperor's private box was and where he would watch and officiate all of the games. The first eight seats going up the uh, wall next to the arena where the senators sat. And right behind them were the rest of the aristocracy, the religious leaders, the aristocrats, the government leaders, people like that. In the middle section going around where you can see some people walking, this is where the middle class sat. Lawyers, bankers, merchants, accountants, people at that social level. Top of the bleachers uh, there in the nosebleed section, uh, this is where the poor people sat, the peasants. But there was one more row of seats at the very top of the Colosseum. This was where the lowest people of Rome had to sit. And 2,000 years ago, that was the women of the city. At 150 feet up, women didn't get a great view, but the shows themselves had to be seen to be believed. So imagine through that archway right behind me, a thousand gladiators pouring in, the emperor sitting here on my right, officiating the games, deciding life and death, 70,000 spectators standing around clapping and cheering. The day at the games was usually divided up into three parts. The morning games were some of your gladiator and animal competitions, man versus man, man versus animal. Uh, the animals were usually starved for maybe three to five days before a game. So regardless of who they put them in with, they were probably going to uh, attack and kill. There was also exhibition fights. Uh, maybe a superstar gladiator was put in the arena with 10 or 15 of the condemned criminals. And this is how they would carry out their executions. Now at the end of the day, they usually closed with a comedy show. So one of the things they did for comedy was uh, dress, again, condemned criminals in the skin of a sheep, and they would uh, put them in the arena with a couple of lions. Thousands of animals were killed in these blood sports, and a steady supply had to be brought in from as far away as Africa and the Middle East. Now, the number of animals that they used would vary uh, greatly depending on the type of celebration. But during uh, the inauguration of the building, Titus declared 100 straight days of games, and they know that on one particular day, over 10,000 animals were killed in one day alone. On ground level was the arena, a wooden floor covered in sand to soak up the blood of animals and human beings fighting for their lives. Today, most of the floor is gone, and you can clearly see the labyrinth of corridors and tunnels that ran underneath to holding pens where some of the animals were kept. This is where the small animals, like the lions, tigers, bears, deer, dogs, things like that, were kept. And they had movable walls that they could raise up and down, directing those animals into the cages or elevators that they wanted to use to get them into the arena. Because at that time, this was all covered then with a wooden floor that had 32 trap doors. And as they put the animals into the elevators, the slaves would pull the ropes, those elevators came up, popped open, and this is how they made the games a bit more exciting, and they kept the gladiators on their toes. But this wasn't where the gladiators expected the much larger animals to appear. They couldn't fit through the tunnel and elevator system. They had their own entrance through this archway. Ironically, this was also the exit where the dead bodies and carcasses were taken at the end of the games. Today, it's hard to imagine that such brutal and bloodthirsty events were enjoyed as family entertainment. But the Colosseum still holds a fascination for visitors of all ages and really fires the imagination of children. As magnificent as the Colosseum is today, it would have been even more impressive in its heyday when almost everything was covered in marble. After gladiatorial combat was banned in the 5th century, however, the construction fell into disrepair, and the stone and marble was plundered to build luxury palaces and churches. Today, buttresses prevent the outer walls from crumbling any further. Even though it's now just a shell, the basic structure of the Colosseum has served as a model for stadiums around the world, and its place as number one in Rome's must-see countdown is undisputed. What we really liked about the Colosseum was kind of the history and the barbaricness of it and the fact that we saw the movie Gladiator and we related to that movie and uh, actually being in the Colosseum was kind of an, an awesome thing to do and see and uh, we just really enjoyed it. I'd like to rent it again after having been there. There's no doubt about the Colosseum's popularity, and for just under six dollars, you too can relive the full gladiator experience. Here on the Travel Channel, we've taken you from the heart of the ancient Roman Empire to the fashionable bars of modern-day Rome. Whether you want to relax and watch the world go by in one of Rome's piazzas or scoot around the city's top tourist sites on two wheels, you can experience it all in the Eternal City.